Uh, good afternoon, friends. I am Terrence Johnson, Associate Professor of Religion and Politics in the Department of Government and a Senior Fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And I'd like to welcome you to the center today. We are delighted to welcome Drs. Jill um, Hicks-Keaton and Kevin Concanon to our community. Jill and Kevin are the co-editors of the recently published volume, The Museum of the Bible, A Critical Introduction, which was published earlier this summer by Lexington Books. The volume draws upon American history, critical theory, Judaic studies, and biblical studies to examine the religious, cultural, and political dimensions of the museum and its representation of the Bible. Dr. Heeks Keaton, an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma, teaches courses on biblical literature, ancient Judaism, and early Christianity. She is the author of several journal articles and of the, and of the monograph um, arguing with a Zenith, Gentile Access to Israel's Living God in Jewish Antiquity, which is published by Oxford University Press. Dr. Con Cannon is an associate professor of religion at the University of Southern California, where he teaches courses um, on New Testament, early Christianity, and theory and method in, in the study of religion. Along with dozens of journal articles, he's the author of um, When You Were Gentiles, Specters of Ethnicity in Roman Corinth, and Paul's Corinthian correspondence. For the next um, 30 or so minutes, Jill, Kevin, and I will discuss um, the Museum of the Bible, whose Bible. And we each sort of will give like a 10 or 15 minute presentation in terms of our contribution to the volume and sort of frame out um, why this introduction is needed and sort of some of the goals and expectations of the project. Um, so again, we are so gra grateful to have you all present. And after our presentations, we'll open up for a broader conversation. So welcome to Berkeley Center. And we'll begin with uh, Jill. Welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. I'd like to begin by thanking Terrence for organizing this and the Berkeley Center for hosting us. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to spend a few minutes introducing what the Museum of the Bible is, some of its history, who's behind it, and then I'll summarize my chapter contribution to the Museum of the Bible, a critical introduction. So the Museum of the Bible, you may know, is here in DC, very close to the National Mall, about three blocks south of the Capitol. It is uh, relatively new, opened in November of 2017, so coming up on its two-year anniversary in a couple months. It's a very fancy museum. It's a beautiful museum. They boast as to be a very technologically advanced, so they're very proud of their exhibits and the ways that they engage people through technology. Here's a picture showing how close it is to the Capitol. This is a very uh, popular shot from within the museum. Uh, and one of the reasons that we think it's significant is because of the political influence that we think that the museum intends to exert or attempts to exert. Here's its location. So the founder of this museum and the primary funder is Steve Green, who is the owner of Hobby Lobby. So his family founded the craft chain store uh, Hobby Lobby, and uh, they are very famous billionaire evangelical Christians who've also been politically active. So you may know them from Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, in which they uh, successfully defeated having to uh, abide by the contraception mandate of the Affordable Care Act. Steve Green uh, is, is one of the funders, but is the primary funder. So the museum likes to share that there are lots and lots of people who have contributed uh, through their fundraising efforts in churches and sometimes in synagogues around the country. It was a, a, the price tag was about $500 million, though I've heard rumors that it may have been more than that. And that does not include the acquisition of the artifacts. So that is uh, merely transforming what was a refrigerated warehouse into this uh, beautiful building. By the way, he lives in Oklahoma, which is why the uh, headquarters of the Museum of the Bible are in Oklahoma City. And I am a biblical studies professor at the University of Oklahoma, but I'm not affiliated with the museum. I'm merely an observer and critic. So the museum has been beset by controversy on a number of fronts. I'm going to briefly introduce three before I get into a more specific critique. So the first is that Hobby Lobby, uh, 
and the museum, by virtue of the connection to Hobby Lobby, have been in trouble with the law for illegal antiquities smuggling, and also for, uh, they, not with the law, haven't been in trouble with the law about the Dead Sea Scroll forgeries, but there's been a question about the uh, legitimacy of their Dead Sea Scrolls. And five of them have been removed from exhibition because they have been shown through research to be modern forgeries. The second controversy, oh, and uh, I want to draw attention to Candida Moss and Joel Baden's work, Bible Nation, the United States of Hobby Lobby, which is a book that details uh, and investigates. They're actually the folks who broke the story about the Department of Justice investigating Hobby Lobby. So this details the antiquities looting, and it includes lots of interviews with the Green family and others involved with the museum. It was published prior to the opening of the museum. And so we pick up with this volume, analyzing what's actually in the museum and doing close readings of the exhibits and addressing these larger issues that I've mentioned as well. Speaking of Steve Green, I recently discovered and thought this was worth uh, bringing to people's attention that his personal website, which is stevegreen.us, presents him next to this phrase, inviting all people to engage with the Bible. Inviting all people to engage with the Bible is verbatim the Museum of the Bible's mission statement. And uh, one of the pieces in the volume details how this, this language of engage is actually taken from the American Bible Society, and it carries with it this idea that if people engage the Bible, that the Holy Spirit will work in them to produce change. So this is an inherently religious word, and specifically Christian. I also want to point out what it says underneath him, also on his website, a non-sectarian approach to presenting the history, stories, and impact of the Bible. So these are sort of two taglines that appear on Steve Green's website that also appear in the Museum of the Bible's materials and PR self-representation. So there is some uh, conflation between Steve Green's personal mission and the mission of the Museum of the Bible. So one of the other controversies, and this is the second one that I'll mention, is that the Museum of the Bible's PR team and the Green family present the museum as what they call, quote, non-sectarian, which is their way of saying that this is an inclusive museum, it represents everyone's Bible, and uh, it doesn't prioritize any particular Bible. And the way in which they think that they've accomplished this is to, quote, let the Bible speak for itself. So this is the, a tagline that um, Tony Zeiss, who is the prior president of the Museum of the Bible, that he has published in this article. But it, if you pay attention to their publicity materials, you'll see that this is a, something that frequently shows up, and particularly in Steve Green's interviews with the media, that they're letting the Bible speak for itself. So the controversy comes in when folks say, well, you know what? That sure does sound an awful lot like a Protestant understanding of how the Bible works. So that uh, sola scriptura, that the Bible can speak for itself to individual readers without mediation, that's a theological tenet and not a historical one. And so the controversy has been uh, critics, including us, saying, well, I'm not sure that's really a non-sectarian approach. That sounds like an evangelical Protestant approach, one that is very in, much in keeping with the evangelical Protestantism of the founder and primary funder of the museum. The third controversy that I'll mention is the Museum of the Bible's reach into the Guild of Biblical Studies, both by controlling access to particular artifacts, and this is something that uh, Moss and Baden detail in their book, that evangelical scholars or scholars at evangelical institutions were given priority access to uh, um, some of the 40,000 artifacts that they own. Secondly, scholarly involvement in the museum has been something that has sort of erupted in the field of biblical studies because the museum likes to share that it has scholarly consultants who have um, are basically rubber stamping the, the exhibits and the museum PR folks trot this out as evidence that the museum has accomplished its goal of being inclusive and diverse and academic and educational. So here's an example from um, museum president Kerry Summers, former president, lifting up the Bible, which is a story of his story of the genesis of the Museum of the Bible, no pun intended. 
The result of this combined effort of scholars, including Jews and Christians, is a wonderfully accurate, agenda-free, engaging, historical depiction of the Bible. So you'll note that he doesn't distinguish between scholars of Christianity and Christian scholars, or scholars of Judaism and Jewish scholars, which I think is an important distinction to make. So the joke that I tell my undergraduates is that I'm a specialist in ancient Judaism, but I'm neither ancient nor Jewish. So it's possible to study something that you yourself are not internal to. And I think that this is an awkward conflation of, uh, of identities. So it is the case that scholars in the Guild of Biblical Studies have collaborated, some have collaborated with the museum, and others of us are concerned that this is an authorization strategy that puts the academic study of the Bible at risk, and that it is being used as a tactic to rubber stamp something that is actually an evangelical presentation of the Bible as non-sectarian or as something that is inclusive, that they have reached their goal. So I want to give just a brief tour of how the museum is outlined, is laid out, and then I will uh, turn it over to Kevin to do some more critique. So there are three permanent floors, and you will note that the permanent floors have the same name as the progression on Steve Green's website, the impact of the Bible, the narrative of the Bible, and the history of the Bible. There are other floors with temporary exhibits, and there's a um, basically like a Jesus-y Chuck E. Cheese for children on one of the floors as well. Um, they, they very much are invested in this language of engagement, so engaging everyone from multiple fronts. Now, I've put the list up here in the order that it appears on the elevator signage, but I want to point out that, and I think this is significant, that if you encounter these floors in the order of going up the stairs, that you first come to the impact floor, and then the narrative floor, and then the history floor. The history floor is the floor on which most of the ancient artifacts are located. And so the, the impact floor that you come to first is an attempt to show how the Bible has influenced artists, fashion, the founding of the United States, the role that is played in controversies such as uh, women's suffrage and slavery. And finally, it ends with an opportunity for visitors to record their own experience of the Bible. I do want to note, if I have enough time, that um, talking about the impact of the Bible is, I think, is not necessarily an academic way of thinking about the influence that the Bible has had on culture. I would want to shift that from the impact of the Bible, which is like the Bible is a singular thing that has been thrown from God, I suppose, and made an impact uh, as if it has its own agency. I'd like to shift that to language of how have people through time used the Bible for specific and various ends. So I think that would be a better way of framing the use of the Bible historically. So then you encounter the narrative floor, which is the most Disney-like. And in fact, some of the uh, design firms who were contracted to work on these exhibits have done theme park exhibits. And so there's a 45 minute, a 30 to 45 minute walkthrough immersive experience that purports to tell the story of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, Tanakh. That this is uh, walking uh, out of Egypt, so you go through the Red Sea, Reed Sea. And it also has a Oh, that's from the, from the exhibit. And it also has what's called the World of Jesus of Nazareth, which is a recreation of what they imagine ancient Nazareth to have been like at the time of Jesus. Though, and maybe Kevin's going to talk about this, you don't meet Jesus there. But there are people playing ancient Jews. One of the critiques is that uh, that I have made in my contribution to, the, to our volume is that it's very possible, alarmingly, for visitors to leave the narrative floor of the museum, leaving Jews in antiquity. So there is not a sense that tradition developed, for example, with the Talmud. Um, and part of that is because they've used this word Bible as an anachronistic organizer of history, and because Christians call the New Testament part of the Bible, but the Talmud is not part of the Jewish Bible, or what we would call the Bible, we get the New Testament, but no sense that Jewish tradition, non-Christian Jewish tradition, continued after the time of Jesus, which is a shame. 
Then we get to the history of the Bible. So the idea that the Bible is speaking for itself in this museum is, just can't be true because we've already encountered lots of interpretive material on the way up to seeing the uh, antiquities that they have on display. The history of the Bible floor takes us on a journey through a telos that the museum has constructed what they call the path to universal access. And it ends with a uh, celebration of evangelical Bible translation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin for more critique. Hi, everybody. So I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily going to get up here to critique. I think what I'm getting up here to do is analyze. Um, and so um, uh, Jill's given us kind of a layout of the museum and how it's organized, and it's kind of, and it's sort of the tell us that it purports to tell, which is that as you go through the museum, you, you understand that the Bible has had this cultural impact, historical, historical impact. You get kind of a snapshot of its narrative, quote unquote, and then you get to see this sort of pathway. And that path to universal access is a kind of, is an interesting trope that uses, it's used over and over in the museum as well as by people who work for the museum. This idea that the history of the Bible is about how the Bible went from a particular group of people, in this case, ancient Jews, and became available to everybody. So along the way, you get a, you get a story of not the Bible's development, transi trans, um, transitions, translations, the complicated history of how these, these literary documents were produced, collected together, disseminated, and that sort of thing. What you get is a, is a series of meditations on, on how, without saying it, God's message in the Bible um, was able to be translated and thus shared with more and more people. And the, so the end of the museum, when you get to the final exhibits, this um, exhibit called Illuminations, the final exhibit, the end of this whole project, um, this whole museum project, you, get, you are supposed to be kind of wowed by the fact that look how far the Bible has come. Look at all that it's done. And look at how much more there is to do. That Illuminations exhibit solicits donations for organizations that are involved in Bible translations. And along the walls of that exhibit are a whole series, a, bi a Bible in every, what they would say, a Bible in every language that, that the Bible has been translated into, um, sometimes marking them as either incomplete or full, and full being a Bible that has the Christian New Testament in it, not just the, uh, the Hebrew Bible. So the Hebrew Bible um, does not really get to count by itself as Bible in the museum. And that's one of the, that's one of the criticisms that um, the, some of the contributors in our volume have noted, is that this is not just a very Protestant museum, but it's a museum that uses Judaism for a number of different purposes. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those things and intersect it with the with some of the issues that I focus on. Um, I'm a biblical scholar, but I also am involved in working with archaeological materials and working at archaeological sites. Um, and so for me, this is a museum because it draws so much on ancient artifacts and on this. I'll go back to the. Uh, yeah, and, and, and sort of attempts to kind of create or recreate a first century um, Galilean village. Um, this is the stuff that, that really draws my attention. So um, as Jill pointed out, one of the things that this that's famous about the museum, or say infamous about the museum, is that it hasn't done a good job of collecting artifacts, or um, collecting artifacts in a legal or responsible way. Um, I should say that they are trying to, to do it, to do some kind of um, accounting for the things that are in their collection and are trying to publish uh, information on that and trying to suss out if they have, if they have acquired any more things um, illegally or through uh, dubious means. Um, and they are seemingly trying as well to determine which of, their docu which of their artifacts are also fabrications, like many of the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments that they uh, purchased uh, have turned out to be. Um, but the use of archaeology in the museum goes beyond these kind of headline-grabbing issues. Um, and um, as, as Jill noted, one of the things that seems to animate both Steve Green and, and the funders of this museum, as well as the organization of the museum itself, is a story about how the Bible um, is not just central to Western and global history, not just a benevolent force in the world um, that, that does things on its own, like that the Bible has an impact. Um, it's also a story about how the Bible has been um, transmitted accurately and uh, stably through time. And as you walk through the various floors of the museum, when, the, when, we talk about the, when they talk about the Bible's history, what they presume is that there is a Bible 
and that people have faithfully copied and recopied and translated that, that thing uh, through time. And archaeology, archaeological evidence and archaeological reasoning is used throughout the museum to make that case. So on the history of the Bible floor, so on, on, on this floor, um, before you enter the path to universal access, um, you're invited to a theater to watch a, a movie called, uh, called Drive Through History with a guy who looks a lot like Indiana Jones, or dresses at least a lot like Indiana Jones. It looks more like he just got out of an, R got out of an REI, uh, named Dave Stotts. And Dave Stotts kind of presents uh, a kind of a, 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 an introduction to the, to the history of the Bible floor. And in that introduction, um, he shows you some archaeological sites um, but, and talks about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but really what his, his, his goal there is to tell you that the Bible has been faithfully transmitted over time and archaeology and all these art artifacts that you're going to see as you go through the museum are there to help you understand that the Bible's path to universal access is a, is, and it's the history of the Bible is, is, is one in which this text has sort of carefully made its way through history. And it's telling that in that narrative, say, for example, European colonialism is presented as not, say, a problem, but as, as a mechanism for getting the Bible to more places. Um, so there's a real blindness to the complicated history of the Bible, the way in which the Bible has been involved, not just in nice things, but in some bad things. Um, and because the focus of, this, of the museum is really about how do we get more Bibles or more Bible knowledge or literacy into the hands and minds of people who visit us and, and by extension to the rest of the world. Now, um, another place where archaeology really becomes problematic in the museum is this village, this Nazareth village. Um, it's, it's, a little, it's a little surreal to walk in. Um, it feels very Disneylandy. y um, I think that the Hebrew Bible exhibit that Jill talked about earlier is much better made. Um, it's just more engaging and more interesting and better, better designed. But the, the Nazareth village is a complicated, strange little place. Um, there you'll find um, fabrications of ancient artifacts, and but usually those ancient artifacts are there to, to grab you and connect you to the Bible in some way, not necessarily to give you a perspective on what it was like to live in the ancient world. Because the thing about archaeology, um, as, as someone who practices it, is that archaeology is something that doesn't really do a good job of telling you what happened when and sort of verifying hunches we have about, about the history of events in the ancient world, archaeology is, is really good at talk, talking about how places were lived in uh, over a long period of time. It's, it talks about, archaeology is sort of there to give you a sense of how things operated, how people navigated environments, but in a kind of broad sweep. Um, and as you go through the, the, the village, what you're given is you're given snippets of archaeological facsimiles, facsimiles of, say, ancient bread making or, or tools that people might have used in a first century village, but all those are, are tagged with, with a Bible verse. So um, the bread is, um, is tagged with, a, with, a, with the parable of Jesus is like the friends who come asking for bread at night. Is that the name of the parable, Jill? I'm trying to remember the name. Right. Um, so, so everything is there kind of drawing you to Jesus. Um, drawing you to the Bible to see like that the that sort of biblical texts are reflected in the archaeology itself. Um, and then when you go, say, to the synagogue or walk around, I mean, you can see these are some actors here portraying, um, portraying ancient inhabitants of this village. Um, when you go into the synagogue, you um, often will meet a, a rabbi or somebody from the village who will come in and talk about synagogue life. Um, and um, in this case, this, this particular rabbi sat, sat everyone down and gave them a and told them a story about how the Hebrew Bible, there in, in a, in, written out in scroll form, uh, was written in ancient Hebrew. And really, none of us in this village speak Hebrew anymore. We speak Aramaic. Um, so the implication is that, is that Jews of the first century couldn't understand their own scriptures. Um, isn't it great that then Christians come along and translate this thing and get it out there for everybody else? But also, because there isn't a lot of, there, because you're in the world here of Jesus of Nazareth, and I should say that the village, this, this village is actually called the world of Jesus of Nazareth. It's not called the Nazareth village. It's, it's Jesus's world. Um, and because we're in Jesus's world, presumably, the problem is, is that unless you want to look at some non-canonical Christian text, if you want to stick to the Bible, there's very little about Jesus in his hometown. 
um, except a story in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus goes to his hometown, goes to his synagogue, unrolls the scroll, reads a little, reads a smattering of things from Isaiah, puts it down, um, and then eventually the Nazarenes like chase him out of town and try to throw him off a cliff and kill him, and he escapes, escapes miraculously. So that's the script that then these characters have to use. So they often talk about Jesus, about, oh, we know there's this guy who's from our village. Uh, his name is Jesus, and we just don't know what to do with this guy. We're, he says some things, and they just don't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us. And you know, I mean, there was this one time where we tried to kill him. And like, I mean, so the script that these actors have to use, because they're so tied to this story of the Bible, is one in which Jews don't understand their own scriptures, where they're, they're too dumb to understand Jesus, and that they actually tried to kill it. I mean, they tried to like exert, I mean, they're, they're violent in a sense. And the actors try to play this off as kind of funny and jokey, but really like when you're, if you're a visitor and you're learning about ancient Nazareth, um, ancient Judaism, you are taught from the very beginning that, um, that Judaism itself was problematic and we're directing our attention to, to Jesus. Um, so there are a number of ways in which archaeology is here kind of used as, um, as a way of doing a different kind of work, as talking about the Bible's historicity, about talking about Jesus, and pointing to that, that kind of classic Christian conception that Christianity is that which takes over when Judaism has kind of run its course. Um, and there's a, final, there's a final element to this that I, that I, would, that I would note, um, is that there's other exhibits at the museum that draw on archaeological materials that are also kind of um, presenting the museum as an alternative form of pilgrimage. So um, this, this particular um, like PR move had, had, uh, came along with the, with, the, with the addition to the museum of a virtual reality Holy Land tour called Explore with an exclamation point, um, where you can sit uh, on the fir museum's first floor, you pay a little extra, you sit in a room, you put on some VR glasses, and you kind of, you kind of, you, you get to watch on a kind of either like steady cam walk or a like a drone flight. Um, you just kind of like zoom around a bunch of different biblical sites in Israel. Um, and the advertising for Explore was, you know, it's really expensive to go to Israel and it's cheaper to come here. So if you really want to go to the Holy Land, this is your Holy Land experience. Um, and along with that, you have this village where you get a kind of approximated first century Holy Land experience. Um, but also up on the fifth floor, um, there is an exhibit that is, um, that is set up as a, as a kind of permanent, um, semi-permanent uh, collaboration with the Israeli Antiquities Authority, the State Archaeological Service of Israel, um, where a number of artifacts from the State Archaeological Service in Israel are put on display. And one of the, th one of the kind of the crowning jewels there is a stone block from the, temple in, from the temple wall in Jerusalem, where you're invited to touch this stone. I mean, you, you, we've all gone to museums, you're not usually allowed to touch stuff, but they invite you to come up and touch, touch this piece of the temple. So throughout the museum, the museum is sort of setting itself up as a kind of alternative Christian pilgrimage site. So it again kind of puts the lie to this question that the museum is this non-sectarian entity that's trying to just tell you about the history of the Bible in a kind of disinterested sort of way. Uh, this is a museum that is selling a, selling a Protestant evangelical Christian agenda, one that is on the conservative side of that particular community as well, um, and that is trying to sort of make going there into a religious experience. Um, and this is just a small segment of what's available in the museum. There's all sorts of other ways, and we talk about this, our contributors talk about this in the book, other ways in which there are uncomfortable um, uh, uh, connections to Christian nationalism, to Christian Zionism, and right-wing uh, right Christian Zionism um, and its connections to Israel, um, as well as um, some really like strange uses of American history. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, and we, maybe we can talk about some of those things down the road, um, but I will now maybe turn it over to Terrence, and he can talk, talk to us about his, his work. So I'm sort of an outlier here because I'm not a biblical scholar or you know ancient scholar, but my work is primarily um, in 20th century um, African American political thought and in American political theory. Um, but um, I also deal with religion and public life, and so it's interesting. As I as I was engaging um, the museum about a year ago, and then I received a call to uh, contribute to this great um, volume. You know, I want to figure out how do I actually engage um, the museum in light of my own sort of political background, um, but also 
in a way that sort of recognizes both the political implications of the museum, but also sort of bear witness to the people who are going there and, and, and sort of in the, in the target audience. And as I was thinking about how do I frame my article, um, I was reminded of sort of two stories by um, the late, great Howard Thurman, uh, who was an African-American mystic and spent several years at Boston University, Howard University, and in San Francisco. And, you know, he talked about his early sort of uh, theological formation and how when he would read the Bible to his grandmother who had been enslaved, she would say, look, read the, read the Bible except for what Paul writes about, you know, slavery. And... He, and he also gives us a sort of account that, you know, when he was in church one Sunday at his father's funeral, he recalled that because his dad did not attend church regularly, that basically the minister sort of preached sort of a damnation kind of eulogy. And Thurman said, if I ever become a minister or ever have any, you know, um, connection to the church, I will never, you know, repeat what I saw happen today. I'm not going to preach someone to hell for reasons that I don't, I'm not really clear about. And what's interesting with the Howard Thurman sort of backdrop is that what's often missing uh, in American uh, sort of interpretations of religion is this kind of critical, sort of undiscovered counterpublic that Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham at Harvard talks about in terms of imagining African American churches as a kind of counterpublic, a place where this kind of critical dialogical um, expression of how African Americans sort of engage this book. Um, has often been ignored. And so I use my piece as a way both to challenge um, uh, the museum, but also as a way to help them sort of, you know, affirm a tradition that's actually often overlooked. And uh, what's interesting is that, you know, historically African Americans ha have viewed the Bible as a kind of talking book. We see this with, you know, Henry, Henry Louis Gates and also with um, Alan Callahan and Vincent Woolbush. And it's, and it's this idea of a talking book that, the book is not dead, it's actually very much alive. And, it, and it's engaging people, right, um, through history, but also exposing, right, um, contemporary needs. And what's interesting is that, despite the kind of critical engagement that we see in terms of, uh, as, particularly with the slaves' approach to the Bible, there is still this kind of deep commitment, right, to a certain kind of Afro-Christianity. And that this, this critical engagement with the, with the Bible in terms of slaves looking at it as a way, how do, how do I actually affirm my human dignity in a context in which I'm told I'm, I'm inferior, I'm subhuman? And at the same time, also then engage a world in which I'm expected to, you know, um, participate in kind of social cooperation, expect, you know, participate in a kind of liberal democracy. So you have that kind of, you know, that kind of tension. Then also this whole tension in terms of what do you do with this whole church piece? And, and the church, for many, for many African Americans, became this place in which it was not only a training ground, say, for understanding biblical literacy, understanding sort of this message of Jesus, but it also became a place where one actually learned about, you know, civic engagement, where a number of our institutions emerged. Um, and the space where human dignity, along with sort of political affirmation, right, were engaged, affirmed, and actually pushed. And what's interesting is that when we walk into the Museum of the Bible, um, particularly in terms of uh, the impact of the first floor, there's this way in which the museum wants to sort of bring in this idea of how you know, um, missionary work where it was very active and, and how the Bible, yes, was involved with enslavement, yes, it was involved with, I didn't even think they used the word genocide, right, um, in terms of uh, indigenous populations in the Americas, but there's this notion in which there is a sort of triumphant end. And the triumphant end sort of ends with, you know, Billy Graham and MLK with open arms. And so I push back and say, look, if we take seriously the African American church as both uh, 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 a part of the American Christian tradition, but also slightly distinct in pushing against it, I want to I use my article to say, well, maybe we should see, look at the counter public and see the museum as a place where people, yes, may affirm aspects of their Christianity, but also should walk away deeply challenged, right, and deeply disturbed by the history. And, and what's striking, I think, what, what African Americans, sort of the genius that we actually bring to the conversation is this idea that, well, one can actually be critically engaged with the text, still have, and still affirm one's faith, right? But recognize that often we have critical conversations internally about scripture that we don't quite understand. 
And maybe we actually do discard it or maybe we don't, but the, the critical engagement nonetheless exists. And I think that is a, a major kind of missing component, right, in, in terms of the museum, in terms of how do we get the museum to actually become sort of self-reflective but also sort of self-critical in recognizing sort of the multiple and competing uses of the Bible. And are we then willing then to a accept the critical uses of the Bible in terms of genocide, in terms of um, enslavement, right, in terms of homophobia? Are we willing to embrace that even as one remains Christian or whatever it is? Because clearly there is a very, it is a very, you know, crystal-centric kind of place. So let's just acknowledge it. But I'm wondering, can we accept that but also be very critical? And I think, you know, if we bring in aspects of, of the black church and Afro-Christianity, we'll have a kind of framework, I think, to actually push the museum and, and, and to push those who actually engage the museum. Because in part, muse museums are a kind of, you know, attempt to reflect the best aspects of different traditions. But there should also be a component within museum life where you get critical information. And the critical information should push one, one's, one's own internal beliefs, but also push the ways in which what is familiar should become rather troubling. And that's where I think I try to enter as a kind of person who's looking at religion uh, and public life. And, and, and the whole issue of race then becomes, again, a, a, I think they're attempting to engage race by including you know, African Americans on the board, but also bring it into the conversation the ways in which you know there are good uses of the bible in terms of um the civil rights movement and how king you know uh, appropriated the bible for, for those purposes but again i i want to push back and argue yes there are, there are good uses of the bible in terms of political ends but then what about the ways in which the bible still is used right to justify uh, what some to justify homophobia right to justify you know um silencing of women in terms of women's ordination I mean, how do we? I mean, how do we sort of engage these kinds of very controversial issues at a place like the museum? And to me, that's the prime place for this kind of engagement because the people who are visiting this place take the Bible very seriously. And I think if we're going to call it a museum, we have to then take responsibility in terms of how do we critically engage our audience. And again, one can be very critical of a text that one loves and adores, um, but yet without that critical engagement. My fear is that it becomes simply a place where we just affirm what we already know and affirm really bad beliefs. Because clearly the Bible has been used for, for multiple reasons. And I would want to push a museum to kind of think through that a bit more. So that's where I think I'll end. And, and, and we'll open up for a conversation. And so um, before we do that, I do want to ask um, Jill and Kevin in terms of, you know, Why do you think? Hello. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So I'm curious in terms of as, as a kind of critical introduction. Can you say more in terms of why this volume is needed in terms of given um, the long-lasting sort of you know tropes of, of a biblical literacy in the U.S. And even though they're not as profound as say maybe 60 years ago, there is a sense in which people are I think ha sort of are scripturalizing the Bible in ways to affirm certain sort of political beliefs. And so what's the role of this volume in terms of, of pushing that audience? And both those who use the Bible to affirm so-called liberal beliefs and also those who affirm so-called you know, uh, religious uh, conservative beliefs. Thank you for that question. So one thing I want to point out is that the volume is not written with the museum as its primary audience. We envision this as an intervention in public understanding of the Bible and its role in uh, the United contemporary United States. So one of the one of the reasons that we think this is important is because at least Kevin and I are biblical scholars, so we're really invested in uh, work every day to teach people to think about the Bible critically. And so the, the Museum of the Bible is probably going to get some more visitors than the people who are trekking through our classrooms, though I will say that they're very popular at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, so this is an intervention, sort of a response from academic biblical scholars and others in related fields and religion and public life as a way to say, well, let's use the museum as a teaching foil. Let's use it as an opportunity 
to uh, help people know what the issues are in our field and what we do and how we study the Bible critically. So this is a, a response. We envisioned it as a response from people who are very much invested in um, educating a public about the Bible. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I think I would go back to what you what you said in your in your reflections, Terence. That um, um, like. Okay, there we go. I'm on now. Okay, um, is that um, one of the one of our one of our uh, our contributors, Margaret Mitchell from the University of Chicago, um, makes this really important point about how the Bible functions in the Museum of the Bible, which is that the Bible um, the Bible has its own agency. It's sort of treated like a person, but it's treated like a really good person. So, like the Bible does things in the museum. So it the Bible supports civil rights or it support or it, it supports the freedom of all peoples. Um, but then when it comes to say slavery, well some people have taken the Bible and used it to support slavery. Yeah, misinterpreted. So it's there are people that are bad, the Bible's good. When good stuff happens, Bible does it. Bad stuff happens, it's people using the Bible incorrectly. And Margaret Mitchell calls that basically like a, an ideology of Bible boosterism, that the, the end goal of, of, going, of, of, of kind of walking through all these exhibits is you're supposed to leave as someone who's going to go out there and be a booster for the Bible, to be excited about it. And I think it's, it's this question of how, like, and, and I, think, I think bringing in Afro-Christianity as a, as, as a bigger voice, or actually, actually to give it a voice in the museum, would be, to, would be to be able to reflect on, look, there are passages in the Bible that make it totally appropriate for people who venerate that text to have slaves. I mean, the Bible says that that's appropriate behavior. Um, and there are passages that, that can be used and used in interesting ways to reflect critically on the practice of slavery. And that in a sense, to be, to be sort of a good historian of the Bible, to think about the Bible's complicated uses, not necessarily impact, but uses in, in global history is to think about how the Bible is not always the hero. Um, and also to think about how complex that history is, that the Bible came together over a long period of time. It's made up of a lot of different voices. Um, and that sense of multiplicity, complexity, um, and ambivalence, the ambivalence about the Bible as a text is something that, uh, that I think is um, dangerous, politically dangerous and culturally dangerous for this museum to sell. Because it sells, you know, when you sell the Bible as like this great thing, um, then people pick it up and can also go and use it without that level of self-reflection to do bad stuff. Um, and so I think the museum is missing an opportunity for a, a, something like a Bible museum to offer a, a, a more nuanced um, site for discernment, for thinking about sort of the complicated ethical questions around biblical interpretation. And I'm wondering, Joe, can you say more in terms of Historically, is it unusual for a group to take a sacred text to affirm their own internal commitments and traditions? And so is this, what is then the Museum of the Bible simply a part of the kind of American exceptionalism? I know this is out of your area in terms of, you know, time period, but in terms of this idea of a city upon a hill, which you noted earlier in terms of, is this simply a part of the American narrative? That are, do a, is this primarily an American sort of phenomenon in terms of, reading the Bible as this kind of, you know, singular event that then we use to affirm and then to reproduce ourselves? Or is this how people, you know, transnationally and also historically have read their sacred texts? If you look at, say, in, in, in antiquity and, or in Israel, what, what, are we reading the text any differently from other groups? Thanks for that. So I, let me speak about antiquity first, because that's what I know best. <laughs> I mean, it took several centuries from the inception of Christianity for there to be anything rec that we would recognize today as a Bible. And I think that that's significant because the museum is using a modern conception of the Bible, which then is retro retrojectively, um, I mean, it's anachronistically putting back this modern idea of a Bible, I think, on antiquity, which is... Um, you know, a strategy that has been used throughout Christian history for Christians to authorize themselves as the correct form of Christianity. And so I think what's happening here is that the museum is using 
this idea of, of the Christian Bible as the ultimate telos. It's the goal. Um, it's what's normative. But also it was always that way because there's not a discussion of the development. And it's a way of authorizing that form of Christianity um, and sort of self-congratulating and, um, and apologizing for it in the sense of a defense. Okay, very good. And Kevin, before I open it up to the audience, um, some within the museum, I said, well, look, you know, when you walk in, we're actually trying to in inform our audience because we have this great exhibit in terms of antiquity, there are different maps, and we, you know, we have archaeological digs. I mean, how would you then respond to their uses of, of, of archaeology in terms of to show the quote diversity of of the Bible, and 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 how, and how is that effort, for good or bad, problematic in, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, as a biblical scholar who uses archaeology um, in in my own work, um, I think that archaeology is has has a role to play in how we talk about the Bible. Um, and I alluded to it a little bit in my talk in that like archaeology is archaeology is really not good about, say, proving that this event happened or that this person was here. Um, though often you go to biblical sites and they'll be like, well, Jesus was here or Paul was here. That's just that's not really what archaeology is good for. Archaeology pays attention to how a space is lived over time. And that's that in all of its messy complexity. Um, when you dig up a, a, a packed earth floor in a small house in an ancient context, you find fish bones, you find food that's there, you find little like lost, you put someone who lost their coin in the bath, in the toilet when it fell into the toilet when they were going to the bathroom, you find that kind of stuff. Um, you get a sense of how a space has been used. And that is really important information, um, not, to say, not to give a background to the Bible, to like, um, but to sort of show the world in which the stuff that is said in the Bible starts to make sense as part of a lived conversation. Um, and that's a historicizing mode of understanding the Bible that presumes in some sense that the, the Bible should be read in its historical context. Um, and for certain purposes, that's really great. I wouldn't say in a confessional context that's a necessity, but it is a different perspective on reading the Bible. Um, and the museum seems far more focused on getting, drawing your attention to the veracity and truthfulness of the Bible um, as as a historically verifiable and accurate thing. It's sort of, um, oftentimes the museum will invoke archeology span proves the Bible. So there are a number of members of the senior staff who will give talks about how, if you look at all the archeology span we've assembled here, it proves the Bible. And, and beyond the question of archeology, span it's the, the question of ancient artifacts. I mean, one of the things that the museum is most famous for is collecting biblical manuscripts. So. Um, the Bible, as we as we encounter it when we pick up a Bible, is is a composite text. It's assembled by modern scholars out of a whole variety of ancient sources. So there isn't there, there's no Bible in antiquity that's exactly the same as the Bible that we read in English translations because um, because our English translations are um, are put together by looking at all so all the ancient manuscripts of the Bible in all of its various diverse forms and um, so the history of the materiality of the Bible is, is really complicated. Um, and we don't get that in the museum. We get sort of look at this old, look at this very ancient manuscript. Look how, and oh, also it's really close to the way that our Bibles are now. So um, ancient, the, the diversity of the New Testament and the, of the Bible over time is occluded. It's hidden from view um, by the way in which the objects that are put on display in the museum are presented. Um, what you're given is, is not a diversity of different versions of the Bible, which there were lots of different versions of the Bible that circulated all through, and not only antiquity, but the Middle Ages, um, and in different parts of the ancient world, so in, uh, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, in Africa, in different places. Um, but what you're given, instead of that diversity, is you're, getting, you're given a history of, look how the Bible went from being in Hebrew and Greek to being in a diversity of languages translated in a lot of different ways and thus spreading the message out. So there's a, there's, there's, there's a history to be told both about the complexity of, of the world in which the, the Bible was, was sort of formed and written and the complexity of how, all, how these texts eventually came to be accessible to us and legible to us in, in something that we call the Bible. Can I mention something before you open it up to the audience? Terence's name is not on the cover of the book but I hope it was clear that he's a contributor, and his chapter is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, but I think this whole point you raise in terms of 
archaeology and from the one hand sort of specialism versus the kind of intellectual slash just you know curious nature that one might pursue archaeology both as academic or non-academic and I wonder if that then doesn't lead to a broader conversation in terms of is it possible then to as a, as a religious person have this deep faith but then have this sort of complicated notion that well my faith may not affirm the archaeology or whatever and so but does that negate or do I need to talk about faith in other words can we have this very complicated understanding of religion, right, that recognizes the limits of our faith traditions and still engage archaeology in a very kind of meaningful way? And, and the reason why I think that's an important, an important question is in part I think people feel as if somehow they lose out on something if aspects of their faith are can't be proven and disproven. Because in part it seems that we often use our faith to affirm what we know in a way that, that I think prevents folk from actually entering. In other words, we, you know, we use this, use our text to keep our communities very small, uh, which is, I think, is, is very interesting. But I think our inability, to, I think, to walk very critically with our faith, <coughs> if one has a faith, you know, I think is, is, is a point. I, I, one of the points you're making, which I think is really interesting, which the museum could have had a, a really strong uh, impact in terms of pushing the kind of ambiguity um, because if we have ambiguity, maybe we're less likely then to burn someone because we think she's a witch and the Bible says you can't burn a witch mm -hmm. or, or beat someone up. You know. so, so let me open up for a conversation. Oh, I see lots of hands here. Um, just say your name and where you're from, please. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name is Hirat Christian Kim. Oh. My name is Hirat Christian Kim. I'm the president of Georgetown Collaborative Diplomacy Initiative. Uh, and I'm also an expert of Jewish studies, a member of Association for Jewish Studies. Um, and I just wanted to ask for clarification on some technical academic matters. Uh, you mentioned that the museum is flawed in saying that people spoke Aramaic and were not uh, able to read Hebrew. But that is actually historically accurate. And I, I put three positions, academic positions, forward to you, and you can respond to that. Uh, position number one. Um, <laughs> The area was heavily Hellenized from about 150 BC onward, and um, a Hebrew as a, a primary language was denigrated in terms of usage on a literary level. Uh, and this is evidenced by um, rabbinic materials all being in Aramaic and not in Hebrew. Uh, and second point is Septuagint that was commissioned by the Jewish rabbis in the Second Temple period. Uh, was put into effect, it's a Septuagint is the Greek translation from Hebrew, because Jews in that period could not read Hebrew, many, many Jews, uh, and that's why they had the Septuagint as the primary uh, biblical text in Jewish communities, and this is uh, clear also in terms of secondary Jewish writings from that period. Uh, we have not a sectarian and non-sectarian Jewish writings, uh, that are written in Greek. Philo wrote in Greek, Philo of Alexandria, and his writing was primary for um, the Jewish populations. And third point is Hebrew and Arabic are uh, different Semitic language groups. They're not even the same language group. Uh, and so historically, linguistically, uh, and from a, a sociological, anthropological uh, levels, uh, I would say the museum is accurate to say that uh, Jews spoke primarily in Aramaic and many could not access Hebrew. And I actually have a fourth point. My teacher, um, Professor John Levinson from Harvard Divinity School, he's argued uh, that Genesis ap Apocryphon uh, uh, is a proof that there was, were massive converts to Ju uh, Judaism from non-Jews. Uh, and King Herod was also an Edomian who converted to Judaism. And these converts to Judaism would not have known Hebrew. Uh, they spoke Aramaic, which was the language, lingua franca of the day, uh, New Greek, which was the cultural, literary language of the day. So I feel like you were being unfair to the, the, the museum and also academically inaccurate. Can you respond to that, please? I think the problem is, is that um, I mean, there are some things that I would that I, I think you're maybe asserting as truth that are not um, historically his, that are debatable. 
The point is not so much whether or not the ancient Jews spoke Aramaic. The question is one of, of the rhetoric of that and the use of that in the museum. You can say a lot of historically accurate things, but say them in a way that leaves a strange impression. And so the point seems to be, because I've, I've been and seen a number of these performances at the museum, the point seems to be emphasizing that ancient Jews didn't understand their scriptures. And it's reinforced by the perception that Jesus talks about them and they don't understand what Jesus is saying. So what it's doing is it's being selectively this, 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 this issue. And yes, absolutely, most ancient um, inhabitants of, of Palestine who, were speaking, who weren't speaking Greek were speaking some version of Aramaic. That was a common language at the time. But the, re the reason you bring that up in, say, a classroom setting is to have a discussion about the complexities of language, language changing over time, demographic, demographic questions. But when you, the way it's framed and the way that's used in the museum itself is to give the impression that the only people who understand these texts are Jesus and the Christians. And that's really dangerous. Um, regardless of whether we, I mean, the, the, it, things can be historically accurate. Things can be said historically accurately, but done so for dubious means. And that's the, that's the issue that we're talking about here, not, not the historical accuracy of these things. Can I put it this way? So. Yes, we must assess whether items are historically accurate or not in the museum, but it's also important to analyze its discursive techniques and rhetorical strategies. So it could be uh, historically accurate, but rhetorically motivated, and that's something worth paying attention to. Yeah, we could say the same thing about, it is, it is absolutely the case that Bibles spread around the world through European colonialism. That was, I mean, that happened. There were missionary societies that did that work, um, that took Bibles to all sorts of places, translated Bibles into different languages. The problem is, is that that, that in endeavor was itself also very complicated and also very messy and very, and very um, damaging um, in the way in which those societies were aligned with certain interests of, European, of the European colonial administrations. So it's very accurate when the museum says, European colonialism spread the Bible all over the place. But then what they don't say is the, is the messy part. And I think that that's, it's, it's, an, it's just the question of, of what is the rhetorical use of things about history that are being deployed here? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, excuse me, this is a very basic question, but um, when there are signs in the museum, when the Bible is quoted in the museum, what, what version of the Bible are they using? There, there are multiple translations that are used. Uh, so a lot of them are King James Version. Uh, some of them are from the um, Jewish Publication Society's translation. So it, it depends on the, the verse that is being quoted. Um, but there is a, a couple of permanent etchings of Bible verses on the wall that come from the King James Version, though it's certainly not a King James only museum, uh, as one might wonder. And then how do you, how do you, um, how do you view they're using the King James Version of the Bible? I mean, <laughs> I mean the King James Version is, it's a pretty translation of the Bible, mm -hmm. and it, it's historically very interesting for that reason. Um, there are some anecdotal report, reports about how important the King James Bible um, has been to the Green family, um, and so um, that was a very that seems to have been a, a part of their upbringing and their their and the the family's connection to to Christianity. Um, and certainly, the King James Bible gets a lot of attention in the in the history of the Bible floor. Um, but it, I mean, it is it. I mean, in some ways, I mean, it depends. It depends on the the place where we're talking about in the museum, um, and, and maybe I'm gonna, I can turn this over to Jill. But there's this um, there's this aspect of the history of the Bible floor, where you have these permanent exhibits, and then there, is, there are these banners that are th that have Bible verses throughout the exhibit, and there you see there all sorts of different translations are chosen. But they're it seems like they're choosing the translations to do a certain kind of work. Maybe you could say a little bit about that banner, the banner problem. 
Well, first, let me say something about the translation. So because the history floor culminates in the Illuminations exhibit, which is a, a celebration of evangelical Bible translations that is connected to uh, Steve Green's brother, um, translation is really important to the museum because it's a tool of dissemination. And so uh, they draw on this language from the American Bible Society of Bible engagement. Be and the American Bible Society's goal is to get Bibles in people's hands. And the logic behind it is that if you get a Bible in people's hands, then they're going to read it and they're going to be transformed and um, in, a, in a Christian way uh, towards, towards you know, recognizing Jesus and God working in their lives. And so I think that translation is important to the museum because of this logic uh, and desire for dissemination. Now, the purple banners are um, that hang on the, along the history floor, I think is, is part of an effort for the Bible to, quote, speak for itself, because these are, they're just like uninterpreted Bible verses. Um, but they're all seem to be chosen because they, they appear to reference the Bible. So there are verses like um, that God's word never returns on, oh, VBS is failing me. What's that <laughs> verse? <laughs> Or like uh, about God's word, uh, all scripture is God breathed from uh, one of the letters uh, of Timothy. And so we, w if one didn't know at what, you know, biblical scholars know that none of these texts is actually a self-referential Bible that they're talking about, um, that they were throughout time and the prophets were speaking, uh, when they talk about the word of God, it was like a, a singular revelation uh, to a particular person in a particular time and is not referring to a modern Bible. So that would be my my critique of the banners, though they the fact that they use different translations from banner to banner is probably an effort to... Um, is probably an effort towards diversity and inclusiveness, though I think that it, it that the banners are um, are ineffective at achieving that goal. Uh, yes, sir. In the back. Oh, in the back, and then we'll come up front. Uh, given that this was founded and largely funded by the Green family, who are you know very publicly evangelical Christians, and you know, I think everyone's familiar with Hobby Lobby and their politics. Wasn't it always going to go this way? I mean, could this have ever been mm -hmm. a piece of serious biblical scholarship? <laughs> <laughs> Can I jump in? Because my question is actually very similar. Sure. Because it seems like there's this, there's this binary here between the historical academic approach and the um, theological evangelistic approach so it's very just it's very similar and that can can the twain ever meet I appreciate what Professor Johnson said about they've missed opportunities to engage to re to re-examine to have these conversations but I guess at this point yeah could it ever be anything else and you use very provocative language with you know disingenuous I guess maybe that's Betty that's it's Shelley's words, but disingenuous. So you really are attributing motive here, and I'm I'm most curious if, to the extent that they are they had a very particular audience in t at the beginning and a very particular idea. Um, can the two actually exist in the same place? And if you were today given a magic wand to recreate it, what would you do? I understand that's not the purpose of your book, but I think it would be interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. Can I start? I actually have a whole PowerPoint presentation about what I would do with $500 million and, <laughs> and the goal of creating a scholarly museum of the Bible and the ways in which it differs from the present iteration of the museum. So with the question of, is, was it inevitable that it would um, authorize an evangelical Christian Bible very similar to that of the Greens, I think that's probably right. And the, the, what we want to put our finger on is the way in which it's being represented publicly. And so it's about their claims to inclusiveness, their claims to diversity, their claims to represent everyone. And um, I mean, it, it appears like a Smithsonian museum. Uh, and even had, at least for a little while, had free admission, uh, similar to Smithsonian museums. It's very close to the National Mall, so I think it's strategically placed in, uh, in that sense. And, and so I think that it's worth interrogating their public presentation. If they were to, to uh, be able to historicize their own conclusions about the Bible, I think it would be very, very different if they were to say, we're a museum of the evangelical Bible, and here's what we believe about the Bible. This is our perspective. We hope that you'll come check it out. 
that would be really interesting, and we would turn this project over to uh, American religious historians studying evangelicalism uh, in the United States today. Uh, and so I think it's it's an issue of the the marketing and the impact that they that they stand to and and I think desire to make. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, I, I think that there are a couple of things that I would would add to that. I mean, it, it's true. I think one of the things that really bought that thing the thing that really ends up kind of getting us maybe bothered would be the right word would be to say that like um, that what this museum is saying is like no we are non sectarian, we're just telling you the history. We're not interested in a particular perspective. And, and that's just not the case for anybody. And so that, that's the problem. And it's not actually a question of, and I think, it's, I think it's, a, um, it's not really clean the binary between what is history and what is the, the faith version of the Bible for a couple of reasons. Um, so in some ways, that kind of presumes the, that evangelicalism is the norm for Christianity because there are, um, you can go to any, uh, any mainline seminary today and get a historical critical approach to the Bible and also turn out to be a perfectly great minister who cares about about Christianity and is committed to it so um, there are large swaths of Christianity in the world that are able to live in this space between taking taking the history seriously but also being committed to the tradition and it's there's a you know I think a lot of times in the United States we have this default that that even American evangelicalism and even a conservative reading of American evangelicalism is just what Christianity is, and they care a lot for a lot of re for a lot of very complicated reasons. They care a lot about the Bible being historical, accurate, stable, um, in order to make to justify and and support the the, the particular version of Christianity that they that they ascend to. So I think it's absolutely the case that you could bring together what I would what, you, what you've described as faith and history. That's not, that's not impossible, and people do it every day, and people have done it in the African-American tradition with an even more critical lens on the Bible than happens oftentimes in, say, in say more like traditional white mainland Protestant, mainline Protestant traditions. So the museum could have been very different, um, in that, and, and it could have offered a different perspective while still being a place where people of faith could feel like they were being connected to their story. And maybe I'm a bit too optimistic, but my sense is that with the changing demographic of evangelicals, I mean, I, I don't want us to presume that all evangelicals in America are white, that I do think that as more visitors come, people are, raise critical questions. And I think the, the changing demographics, but also sort of the, the changing, I think, you know, politics in the US in terms of how do we, you know, wrestle with issues that we have bracketed for so long will force the museum to have this sort of self-critical eye or it will fold. I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's very difficult for institutions to remain alive when they are closed in terms of when they have a kind of very kind of internal sort of locked position. And, you know, I think, you know, look at Georgetown, certain places are just forced to open up. And it may take some time, but I I don't know. I, I think that the, 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 the changing issues in terms of, of what people are, are looking for in terms of, you know, um, you know, recent grads, millennials, whatever they're called now, I think they're going to—they're they're demanding different things from uh, our publics, and I'm not sure the museum will survive if it doesn't, um, you know, change this kind of very sort of, you know, kind of nationalist approach to understanding uh, of the Bible. And even the whole question of whose Bible it is—that's that, like that's a really really good question to think through. So, could I before we move on? Could I return to the question of what would you do yeah. if you had? you know, to build a museum exhibit. Um, so I, I think that one of the fascinating things about studying the Bible is how various religious traditions, including evangelicalism, deal with the clash that is inevitable between historical critical conclusions about the Bible and faith traditions. And that's something that I have to be keenly aware of, especially in my job, because I teach at a public institution in the Bible Belt. And a lot of my students are um, are like the Greens, go to church with the Greens and so forth. And um, and so because I am a professional biblical scholar, I have to tell them, them things in class that, that make them a bit uncomfortable um, and that rub against some of their faith convictions. But that's one of those things that, um, that then we can have a conversation about what are various ways that people in different traditions have dealt with that 
moment. And, uh, and I think that that could make for a really fascinating museum exhibit. What happens when, oh, there are other theories about how uh, Israel was formed rather than the conquest of Canaan as narrated in Joshua, the book of Joshua. Well, let's look and see how various traditions have reacted to that and incorporated that in, or, or entirely rejected it. Um, and that that could be a really interesting way to enter into that conversation. You've been waiting very patiently. Yes. Hi, I'm Rebecca Carter Chan, um, acting director of the programs on ethics, religion, and the Holocaust at the Holocaust Museum, which is just down the street from the Museum of the Bible. And uh, so I'm thinking of, of everything that you said in, in light of museums here in Washington and you know uh, academic history and scholarship on the one hand and um, public history and engagement on, on the other. And I commend you uh, in so many ways from the presentation. I look forward to the book, um, thinking a lot about um, what you said about uh, historical accuracy and also taking seriously the rhetorical um, devices and the broader narrative that's being told in, these, in, in our museums. Um, I, I think it's a sobering reminder for all of us who work in, in museums to, to be aware of that. So uh, I guess you've answered some of my questions uh, already in your past comments about um, the reception and the museum being situated here in Washington, DC. But do you have more of a sense of um, the visitors who have been coming, any statistics, um, and how the, um, the founders and the, the people operating the museum are interacting with the Jewish community? Um, I've heard stories and things so, uh, <laughs> about uh, about Torah scrolls and the desecrated Torah scrolls and being restored and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I would just say we'd love to hear those stories. Be interesting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna, I, I actually just wanted to say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> that specific thought. So, yes, the the Torah scrolls are are a sticking point because of. Um, many scholars and also Jewish religious adherents who are uncomfortable with the Torah scroll, retired Torah scrolls being displayed um, rather than um, buried in a, in a liturgically buried. Um, and so, you know, that's one of, the, one of the things that I think is problematic in the way that the museum is laid out because Jews become instrumentalized, ancient Jews become instrumentalized as um, sort of purveyors of, or not purveyors, but as like custodians of what ultimately would be transferred to Christians. And um, one of the chapters in the book is written by Professor Mark Brettler at Duke University, and he performs a thought experiment that's really interesting. What if we had a museum of the Jewish Bible? What would it look like? And he uses the current Museum of the Bible as sort of a foil to teach how the Jewish Bible is different from and, and including not just its contents, but also the fact that he, the Hebrew language is really important, um, reading it in Hebrew is important, and uh, other differences and how it has been received and how it's currently used. And, um, and it's strikingly different, the conclusions that he is drawing, and he's coming uh, self-consciously in the writing as an observant Jewish biblical scholar who also engages in historical criticism. And uh, so that has been my, my experience with speaking with uh, Jewish critics of the museum. And in terms of demo the demographics of who's going, um, I don't think that the museum has, has released any of that information. They've, they've talked about how many people have, have come through the museum. I think it's over a million at this point. That was in the first year. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people are going to it. Um, actually, today on, on Twitter, because you know Twitter um, lets us know these things, um, a colleague of ours, James Biello, at Miami University of Ohio, um, is who's an anthropologist who studies, I mean, who has been studying Christian museums, um, is started. As he he announced on Twitter he's been doing this project where he's taking um, geotag um, information from uploaded pictures that visitors put up on, say, Pinterest or or on Instagram, and trying to figure out like what are the places in the museum that they're tagging. Hmm. So, like, what, which, what are the things that they are, are they, that visitors are taking their pictures in front of? Um, and so he's he's done like uh, he started saying this morning that he was asking people to guess what are the what are the exhibits that most people would be standing in front of. So, so there's interesting work going on um, out there about sort of thinking about what is it that that's really capturing the attention of visitors, um, and what are they using to display for their own self 
self-representation purposes. Hopefully, we'll, that will be forthcoming, hopefully. So we have a hand here, and then we'll come up to your sir. Right here, the striped shirt. Hey, thank you. Um, just to follow up on uh, the previous question, I was wondering if you have a take on the, uh, the Israeli participation or engagement in the museum, particularly in the antiquities side, and also the way in which the, uh, the museum is trying to make a particular claim about the Bible's um, shaping of America, the United States, and Washington, D.C. in particular. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can talk about the, the sort of the archaeological side of that connection. Um, so if you go to the, I, the IAA exhibit on the fifth floor, it's actually a quite good exhibit. Um, I think it's I think the kind of touch a piece of the Western Wall thing is a little is, is a little strange, um, but the exhibit itself is actually really well done, well curated, and the signage is really is really well 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 handled. Um, there was another exhibit that was it may still be there, but it, it um, called Jerusalem and Rome, um, which uh, was a temporary exhibit on loan from he was it Hebrew University. They were involved, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, Hebrew University's collection. And there, um, the exhibit was also very interesting. The signage was really good, was really was really interesting, uh, really well done. But I went on several docent-led tours, so tours led by employees of the museum of that temporary exhibit. And the docents gave historically inaccurate and misleading descriptions of the exhibit itself. So. Um, the way that I would then put it is that there are interesting collaborations that have been done in good faith with the museum and trying to present nuanced um, accounts of, say, ancient Israel or first century Jewish life um, from reputable and, and you know, very academic um, institutions. But the problem is, is that once it's in the museum, it is subject to all sorts of other uh, interpretations, either by the, the docents that are hired to present this material and maybe aren't super well trained, um, to the overall rhetoric of the museum's exhibits and its design and flow that will kind of pre-frame your interpretation before you even get a chance to look at any signage. So I think it, I, I, I'm, I worry that otherwise reputable and high quality academic institutions or archaeological services that get involved with the museum end up supporting the larger ideological frameworks, um, even as they're trying to present their materials in ways that are, are academically rigorous. Let me jump in about passages. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Mark Chancy at SMU has written about the Museum of the Bible's connections with an organization called Passages, which is a group that sends college students uh, to Israel on sort of a, a Holy Land experience that uh, through his very deep research, he was able to show that, and this is a has now been adapted uh, for the book, he was able to show that this is actually a politically uh, motivated organization and um, that it participates in Christian Zionism and that it, it is uh, pro-Israel political activism. And he uh, was able to show through looking through, because Museum of the Bible is a nonprofit entity, looking through their tax filings, uh, how much money that they had given to support. So the college students pay very little to go on this trip to Israel. And so the museum, through these donations to passages, has been promoting uh, pro-Israel political activities. Uh, and and um, so I think that that's important to note. They have they have claimed, uh, I don't know if they've done this publicly, but privately to us, that they are no longer doing that because they recognize that it is not consistent with their claims to political neutrality. Uh, but we'll, I guess we'll see in the next text filings. <laughs> And in terms of the American context, there's clearly a way in which they've tried to weave together this idea that aspects of the Bible, yes, were used by bad actors, but also played a huge role in framing American democracy. And so that it, you walk away thinking, well, yes, there are bad moments in terms of bad uses of the Bible, but at the end of the day, it's sort of a big rot that then is linked to the Constitution, which, again, we need to sort of think through a bit, a bit more critically. You've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Uh, hi, I report on the Christian right as a political movement, and I've been to a number of events that have been held uh, at the Museum of the Bible. And I wondered if, I think you mentioned uh, in passing Christian nationalism, its connections to Christian nationalism. I wonder if you could say more if you kind of took a look at who uses the museum as kind of a base for their DC activities and their politicking. 
So, I mean, that has been something that, that there was a time when, there was a time when, when, when um, the museum seemed to be more open to connecting with biblical scholars and be, and, and sort of seemed to be asking for our input. And one of the things that um, was continually brought up was who do they rent their space to? Um, and so there, and there, there are a, there have been a lot of groups, and continue to be a lot of groups who who rent spaces at the Museum of the Bible, some of their their event spaces, um, who are very deeply tied to very far right, and man, in many cases, I would say like very fringe forms of, of conservative evangelicalism. Um, and it and it was one of those things where every time you bring it up to the museum leadership, they're like, oh, we didn't know, and like, well, maybe maybe the two wings of your Maybe the departments in your museum should be talking to each other about like what are our what are our values, what are our limits, what are our ethics around hosting certain uh, giving event space to certain kinds of groups versus who we're actually renting to. So one of the examples, um, I can't remember the name of the organization, but under pressure from biblical scholars led by Mark Rettler at Duke, the Museum of the Bible canceled an event at the last minute and bust people. Um, to the Trump Hotel uh, was the alternative location. And I mean, I'm sure you already know this, <laughs> but right. So, um, but I have done a lot of um, searching uh, for Museum of the Bible on Twitter just to see what comes up because they don't publicize what the private events are that are being held in their event spaces. And uh, it, it, it part the most of the, the folks who are attracted to the Museum of the Bible for their event spaces are organizations that participate in um, evangelistic efforts or what, what Margaret Mitchell calls Bible boosterism. So um, I doubt that, for example, the Society of Biblical Literature uh, will have its meeting in their event spaces because the, there seem to be um, organizations that are sympathetic to the goals of the museum that I think are not uh, publicly articulated by the museum, but that are uh, clear when one does analysis of it. Um, yes, ma'am. So I just have a quick question. I'm a Georgetown alumna. But um, do you, is there a fear you have, you know, that, that, that sort of motivated writing about this book that our politicians might in some way be influenced, you know, in terms of the proximity uh, to the Capitol? and based in Washington, D.C. Was that something that you were thinking about? And the second part of my probably question would be, well, what about the our constitutional uh, mission of separating church and state? You know, if, if that's in place, then do we have anything to worry about? And lastly, well, how did they acquire this space uh, to put up such an institution? I'll start with the, the fear question. I, I don't think that it's something to be afraid of, but it's that the potential political exertion um, is something to pay attention to and is something to be to be watching. Um, because what I would hate to happen is for a, a white evangelical Bible to become normalized as America's Bible. Um, and for their, the museum's presentation of the Bible to be, um, I don't want them to be successful in claiming this as everyone's Bible. And, um, and so I'm not sure that it's, that it's fear, but it's a sense of responsibility to pay attention and to be aware of it. And I've forgotten your second question, so I'm going to answer the third one now, um, which is that they they bought a re what was a refrigerated warehouse and uh, and renovated it into the the Green family bought it and renovated it into this museum. So what was the second part of your question? Uh, oh, the political influence. Yeah. Now I remember. There was an interview. Y'all can stop me at any time, but I'm going to keep going until then. <laughs> there was an interview uh, on. PBS on the day of the museum's opening, November 17th, 2017, in which Jeffrey Brown, I think that's his name, is that his name? Jeffrey Brown, um, interviewed Steve Green, and it aired on, on the museum's opening day. And Green said, um, Jeffrey Brown 
said, well, isn't it a political, I mean, this is a paraphrase, isn't it a political statement for you to be so close, put a museum of the Bible so close to the Capitol? And Green demurred and said, well, but we wouldn't mind if our congressmen and congresswomen came here and saw the impact that the Bible has had on the United States. And so I think that's also something to be paying attention to is the, the, the rhetoric that, you know, we wouldn't mind. It's an open invitation. And, and there was a, there was a time where from um, from from say from Moss and Baden's reporting on this that they considered other locations for this museum when they began to sort of think about where they're going to go with this project. Of, the Green family had been collecting all of these artifacts. It's unclear at what point it became clear to them that they wanted to build a museum to house them in, um, but there were other sites that were that were thought about as potential locations, and so they they chose to come to DC. And they chose to, to put it where they could, on the upper floors, you could see the Capitol. And then they, they sell that in their advertising. That view is, is prominent. Um, and you can also go on one of the, they have a ride called um, Washington, Washington Revelations, Rosh, yeah, Washington Revelations where you, you, you're you immersed in this like 3D theater where you're like strapped into a, like a standing chair and you fly around DC and what you see, what they do is they fly you, and they fly you in and look at a monument, and look, there's a Bible verse etched on the, on the monument. This, and then they pull you back out really fast, and then you fly over somewhere else, and then you zoom in, and like, oh, there's a Bible verse on this building. Um, so there is definitely a, a, an interest in saying we're in D.C., and D.C. is the, the, the center of American power, and the center of American power has the Bible written all over it, and that's a very political statement, um, and that that has the potential not necessarily to maybe influence all of our political representatives, but definitely to in, um, influence people who, who vote um, and the, the kinds of politicians that they would think that they need to vote for. And it's interesting in terms of their use of experts to both affirm the museum but also affirm the um, artifacts. You know, thinking through some of the museums I visit in D.C., I don't recall such an emphasis on an advertisement in terms of we have scholars on hand who have proven that this is actually correct. I mean, people will use scholars in terms of, well, here's an exhibit for this particular exhibit to talk about this exhibit, but there's a way in which they attempt to affirm both the artifacts but also the mission of the museum is a very political kind of move in terms of desire to have a certain kind of affirmation. And where else can you receive this kind of validation from a wider audience other than D.C.? I mean, if you have a Museum of the Bible in Atlanta, well, people would expect that, right? Because it's the South or all kinds of, you know, stereotypes. But in D.C., and along with their efforts to reach out to the academic community, is, I think, a, an exertive sort of political move to justify a particular reading of the Bible. So I think it's very much a political, um, their marketing as well as how they're framing um, the Bible, is, it's, it's very political. So yeah, one, I have time for one last comment. Did you have your hand raised? Yes. Any studies, or have you looked into who's actually going to this museum? The one time I remember passing by Federal Center Southwest, which is the metro station nearby, seemed like there were a lot of MAGA hats wearing people. And are these um, lower educated, you know, non-critical thinker people who go to this museum? So I'm going to defer to uh, James Biello, or Biello, I'm sorry, James. Um, <laughs> on the demographics of who's visiting, because I think he, he's an anthropologist who's going to have more of a handle on that. Um, but the second part, I had an answer to, and then it left my mind. The MAGA hats? Sorry. Oh, the educated part. Yes, thank you. So um, Steve Friesen at the University of Texas has uh, made a, a public presentation in which he argued that uh, he showed pictures of and discussed several other kind of Bible museums that, that exist, and many of them are creationist Bible museums, and the Museum of the Bible is not, so it is not sort of participate in the same kind of apologetics as the Ark Encounter, for example, which is a prime example of the creationist museums. And what Friesen argued, I think persuasively, is that the Museum of the Bible is trying to reach a different class. And that so this is for um, people who fancy themselves educated, 
who are um, can't afford to travel to DC to come see all the Smithsonian museums and the Museum of the Bible, and so it's appealing to educated uh, upper class, and that that's what its its intended goal is. And I, I find that persuasive. And when I look in terms of how they're trying to go after certain African American communities, they're clearly going after the kind of the mega church sort of where you have a strong sort of, you know, middle class populations. And you look in terms of their outreach to African Americans, clearly they're going after sort of professional class. So that, that would make sense. Thank you all for the great conversation. Thank you for coming. Thank you to our guests. It's, it's great to have